All right, so uh, good morning, everyone from uh, San Diego. So my name is Chris Keon. Um, I'm going to be presenting uh, today some work on our single cell DNA methylomes uh, that we use to identify distinct neuronal populations uh, that uh, and show conserved regulatory signatures in mouse and human cortex. So uh, this has been a project that's been underway for about two and a half years, um, and uh, we just recently published it um, in the Journal of Science. Um, so back in August. Um, and there's a, there's a website associated with this that I wanted to share with everyone. It's a brainome.org. Um, it, it's, it's turned into a great resource that you'll learn more about as we go through this. So, um, and then I'll show this slide again at the end. So let's see here. Okay, and I also just wanted to introduce our team quickly um, before I get started. So this was a big collaboration between the Salk Institute and uh, University of California, San Diego, which is where I'm at. So. Uh, Drs. Joe Ecker and Margarita Behrens at Sulk, and then my advisor, Aron Mukamel, here at UCSD. Um, so Chung-Wen Luo is, uh, one of the, was the first, one of the co-first authors on this project, and uh, he really worked on the sequencing technology and a lot of the analyses, whereas uh, me and Jing Tian and Jun Hao focused on the analyses portions of the experiment, and then at the bottom there we have Vicente, Joe, and Rosa, who are techs that helped with uh, dissections and sequencing. Um, and then also this was funded by the Brain Initiative Project and I had some additional funding from uh, NIH as well. So, so uh, the, the Brain Initiative Project, one of the main objectives for it was to identify the different types of neurons in the brain and determine the roles that they play in health and disease. So uh, since this was funded by the Brain Initiative, this was largely one of our objectives. So why is it important that we do this? Um, well, first off, it's important to uh, know what cell types are to be able to characterize neural circuitry. So you can understand kind of how circuits are connected and then what their activity may, may perform, may be related to. Um, let's see here. Um, so it's also important for understanding typical and atypical development. So, so how is it that these circuits do form over development? Where do the neurons migrate from? How are they connected? And then how does this go awry in diseases like autism? and schizophrenia. Um, furthermore, uh, it will give you greater resolution into characterization of disease pathology and progression. So for example, in schizophrenia, parvalbumin cells have been implicated, um, but are there multiple types of parvalbumin cells? If so, which subtype is uh, kind of implicated in this disorder and what exactly is, is going wrong in that cell type? Um, and then also just sort of putting it all together by understanding the components of the brain, the different neurons, how they're connected, their electrical activity, how that's associated with the um, coming online of cognitive functions over development, um, we can get a theoretical understanding of how the brain processes information. And so there are multiple approaches to going about uh, identifying cell types. Uh, the first one is the morphology. Um, let's see here. So, uh, so the morphology is one example that you can use to uh, identify brain cell types, so based on the shape of the neurons and their connectivity patterns. Um, the second one there is more specifically their connectivity patterns. Um, next are markers, so in this case molecular markers, so what genes are particular neuron types expressing. And then also there are intrinsic properties such as uh, the action potentials that they're firing. I mean, there are many different characteristic types of action potentials that are associated with different cell types. Now, the molecular markers is one that's of great interest to us, and it's uh, really uh, gained some attention as of late because it scales really well. So, for example, a lot of people have developed single-cell RNA techniques. Um, shown here. And so the, the study that I'm showing you is a single-cell RNA study that looked at six cortical regions to identify neuron types. Um, each point in the plot up there corresponds to a neuron type, and, or sorry, to a neuron, specific neuron, and then the excitatory ones are shown on the left, and the inhibitory ones are shown on the right, and you can see that there are multiple subtypes within those that they identified in the study. Now, uh, there have been other studies that have looked at this as well in mouse, um, for example, in the hippocampus and the somatosensory cortex uh, by Zeisel et al. out of Stin Linderson's group, and then also there was another study that looked at the mouse visual cortex as well. And so, uh, RNA, so this is all using single cell RNA-seq. Um, it does have some limitations, such as it only measures transcribed regions. Um, 
RNA is highly sensitive to short time scale changes, so it's basically a bit noisier than a DNA methylation data might be. Um, and then also there's a weekly signal from lowly expressed genes. So our hypothesis was that DNA methylation might be a good uh, uh, complementary way to look at uh, cell types. And so what is DNA methylation exactly? Well, it's the covalent modification of a genomic cytosine by the addition of a methyl group shown here on the right, where the methyl group is circled there in red. It is an epigenetic mark that generally suppresses gene expression. So when it's present, uh, genes are typically turned off. When methylation is absent, that's indicative of the gene being expressed. It predominantly occurs in what's called a CG context. So uh, the cytosine that is methylated is followed immediately by a guanine. However, uh, our group has found in, uh, back in 2013 that there's abundant non-CG methylation in neurons, and that's negatively correlated with gene expression. Uh, and it, uh, the, the accrual of non-CG methylation in neurons uh, occurs over synaptogenesis and over early development. But its function is largely still not understood. And then finally, in another study by our group, uh, we showed that CG methylation and non-CG methylation show neuron type specific profiles. So that gave us the, the information that we needed to know that we could probably use this as a method to uh, identify neuron cell types. And, and just sort of a, a symbolic note here, I'm gonna be using this uh, MCH uh, terminology to refer to non-CG methylation throughout the talk, just so you guys are clear. Okay, so the objective of the study then was to collect 3,000 plus single cell methylomes from the frontal cortex of both mouse and human. Then we cluster the cells based on genome-wide patterns of methylation and identify and compare normal cell types in mouse and human. And then we want to identify and validate marker genes and gene regulatory elements. Okay, and so this is the data collection pipeline. It is, uh, the, the technique was uh, first published in our paper and the, the protocol and the reagents are available through SWIFT Biosciences if people are interested in, in trying this out. Um, so it starts out with a dissection and then you isolate the nuclei. Um, then we use fact sorting for new and positive to isolate the, uh, the neurons specifically. Um, then you collect the cells in, uh, in individual wells, do bisulfite conversion which is how we measure methylation. And I have a slide on that after this to kind of clarify. Um, and then there are some few final sequencing steps that have to do with multiplexing, amplification, and then actual the sequencing. So just to give you guys a brief uh, tutorial of bisulfite sequencing, if this is the original sequence you wanna measure here and the cytosines in blue are what you're interested in, you wanna know whether they're methylated or not. What you can do is you can treat the DNA with bisulfite and what that does is it converts the unmethylated cytosines to uracils. So now when you sequence the DNA, uracils sequence as thymines and the, the methylated cytosines still sequence as cytosines. So we can compare our sequenced DNA to a reference genome that we may have. And anywhere where a cytosine was sequenced as a cytosine, we know that it was methylated. And wherever a cytosine was sequenced as a thymine, we know that it was unmethylated. And so using this technology, we can reconstruct the methylome across the entire genome. So here I'm showing you the number of cells that we collected um, for mouse. So with mouse, we did kind of a unique experiment um, because we wanted to be able to see that if we took tissue from just the superficial layer of the cortex, that those neurons actually showed up in the superficial layer in terms of our uh, cell types that we identified. So we have a superficial dissection, a deep layer dissection of cortex, and a middle layer, and uh, the respective numbers uh, of cells from each of those populations. And then we also have uh, an undissected uh, sample as well, which we would expect to sort of uh, be throughout the different cell types. And in total, we have about 3,800 cells. And you can see in the bottom plot that the coverage in there is about 5% on average throughout these, uh, these different uh, cells. So for human, we have about 2,800 cells, and we didn't do the dissection with the human where we separated the layers of the cortex. We just have a, an undissected sample. Okay, and so this is the, the clustering methods, basically. So first off, one of the challenges of this is the coverage is sparse. 
So in each cell, you only have about 5% of the genome covered, but that is, uh, that, uh, the 5% that is covered is random and varies throughout different cells. So what we did was we bend the data into 100 kb bins, and we use the non-CG methylation instead of CG methylation, because the non-CG methylation is typically more variable over larger scales, spatially, than the CG methylation is. Um, we used a technique from the, one of the previous single cell RNA papers called backspin, which was used to cluster the cells. And so what it basically does is it, uh, it's an iterative algorithm. At first, you start with all of the cells, you sort them in one dimension based on similarity, and then you find an optimal cut point to divide that into two groups. So then once you divide it into two groups, you repeat that process iteratively until you meet these stopping criteria. And so in our case, we decided that um, if any group had fewer than 50 cells in it, that we would stop dividing because that would be about a 2.5x coverage and we didn't feel comfortable um, kind of breaking it down further than that because the coverage just isn't sufficient. And then also if we had less than a 5% increase in the average correlation within the new clusters, which would suggest that there's just not really picking up new variants in those subtypes. Um, and then what we did is after we clustered the cell types and stopped on those uh, stopping conditions I just mentioned, we remerged cells if they didn't have greater than, uh, greater than seven marker genes. Sorry, that's a typo. It should be greater than seven marker genes. Um, so, well, it, actually that's correct. So clusters were remerged if they have less than seven marker genes. Um, and, and we use seven, it's, it's a bit arbitrary, but we, we really looked at the data to try to make sure we felt confident in the clusters that we were calling. And then finally for visualization, we use a technique called T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, which is called T-SNE. Um, it's, uh, it's a data dimensionality reduction. And the, the, the key thing about it is that it's a nonlinear reduction technique. So unlike PCA, which does linear data reduction, this can um, really contain a lot of nonlinear structure in your data and merge it, uh, reduce it down to a nice visualization. So I'm gonna start now and I'm gonna sort of build up the steps of the analysis so you guys can see how it all comes together. So what I'm showing you now is uh, the T-SNE plot for mouse. Uh, all the cells are colored green, there's no clustering that's been performed yet, and each point corresponds to a cell. So you can see just from an unsupervised clustering sort of standpoint that there is structure um, in, the, in this plot. So what exactly is that structure? Well, the first thing that we did was we ran backspin and uh, we identified clusters. And so backspin is ran independently of the T-SNE plot. However, you can see there's a very nice correspondence between the clusters that we det detected using backspin and um, the, the sort of visual separation of the clusters in T-SNE. So that was a good sign that things are working. So then the next thing we wanted to do is, uh, is really sort of identify what these clusters are now that we have them. Um, and so for mouse, we had what we call bulk samples. These are purified cell types, such as parvalbumin positive, somatostatin positive, uh, VIP positive. And we also had a, a, a panextitatory um, bulk cell type, which was stained for, or which was using uh, camk 2 a And then uh, we had a new and positive sample. And you can see that the inhibitory samples that we have cluster very nicely right within these uh, clusters that are off to the right. They're, they're, they're nicely situated there in the middle of those, which gave us pretty good confidence that these are in the inhibitory types. The excitatory um, is, a, is a mixture of numerous excitatory cell types. So it's not surprising that it doesn't fit right in the middle of one cluster. So it sort of suggests that this general area is excitatory cell types. And the new end positive is largely going to be driven by excitatory cell types as well. Um, so this sort of suggests that maybe the excitatory cell types are on the left. Um, now looking at our layer dissection, if we look at the undissected cells, they are sort of distributed throughout, shown in color there. Um, there's no clear pattern as to where they're coming from, which is what we would expect. If we look at our superficial layer dissection, we can see that all of those are sort of distributed throughout the top of the uh, plot. The middle layer is sort of distributed throughout the middle and the bottom of the plot. 
and the deep layer is distributed throughout the lower portion of the plot. So putting all this information together, we have a pretty good sense that the you know, parvel albumin cells, somatostatin and VIP cells are off to the right, and that the excitatory cells are distributed from a superficial layer at the top, going all the way down to the deep layers at the bottom. So there's this nice stratification which would correspond to um, the known layers of the cortex. Um, and then the, the, another thing that we use to better interrogate the clusters is that we use known marker genes and some new marker genes. So for example, COX-2 is a nice known marker of superficial layers in the cortex. I'm showing the Allen brain atlas in C2 uh, stain there on the right. You can see that it's nicely uh, staining the upper layers of the cortex. And on the plot on the left is our T-SNE plot. And what I'm doing is I'm coloring the cells based on their methylation level. The blue indicates hypomethylation, which would be consistent with a gene being expressed. So you can see that what we're suspecting were layer 2, 3, and layer 4 is, uh, is uh, hypomethylated for COX-2, uh, and therefore expressing COX-2, which is consistent with the Allen brain atlas stain here. And so we can do this for many markers. For example, ROR B here is a sort of a middle layer marker, as you can see on the right and it's hypomethylated in sort of the middle layers of excitatory cells. And then I have two uh, deep layer markers here as well, FOXP2 and TLE4. And you can see the, their correspondence in the Allen brain atlas. So once we put all this information together, we looked at many marker genes, we had our bulk samples, uh, we had the dissection, we were able to come up with sort of a consensus about what the cell types were. And we identified 16 cell types, that showed a, an expanded diversity really in the deep layer neurons. So if we just focus on the plot on the right, it's the same t plot I've been showing you, it's just colored and labeled now. So the left half has our excitatory cells, the right half in the peachish pink color has the inhibitory cells. On the left, you can see it goes layer two, three, uh, let me use my mouse, layer two, three, layer four, there are two layer five clusters here, um, there are some deep layer clusters, and I'll explain that in a moment. And then there are two layer six clusters. So the deep layer clusters showed markers of both layer five and layer six, so we couldn't fully differentiate between them. So we just called them deep layer as a general term. Then on the right, you can see that there are uh, possibly multiple clusters of somatostatin cells labeled here. There are these inhibitory types called NDNF, um, which are labeled here. We detected two types of those. And then we detected one cluster of P, uh, VIP, and then also a cluster of parvel albumin. And then on the plot on the left is just showing kind of how these cluster together, and it's pretty much as you would expect with the inhibitory cells clustering together and the excitatory, clusters, uh, excitatory cells clustering together. Now, we basically repeated that uh, a very similar process for humans, and we identified 21 cells here. It's uh, a kind of a similar layout. Uh, we, you having um, sort of superficial layers to, to sort of deep layers down here, and then you have inhibitory on the right. Um, as I mentioned, we identified 21 clusters here, so it's a, a bit more than mouse. There seems to be a similar expansion of deep layers in human. For example, we have deep layer three and one and two. Uh, we have multiple layer sixes here. Uh, we have multiple layer fives as well. So uh, across both species, we see this uh, deep layer expansion, but it seems to be actually increased in human. For the inhibitory cell types, we also uh, observe sort of a, an increase in the number of inhibitory cell classes as well. For example, there are uh, three somatostatin types that we're detecting, whereas in mouse, we only detected two, I believe. All right, so then uh, just as kind of another validation, we wanted to correlate our results with existing RNA, single cell RNA-seq studies. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, so this is the, the study from Zeisel et al. Uh, they included oligodendrocytes uh, as well as other glial cell types in their analysis. So you can see that there are some uh, columns there that are basically all red, which means we didn't detect any matching. Um, what the, what the colors indicate is the correlation between the methylation and the uh, single cell RNA gene expression. So because methylation is suppressive of gene expression, you would, you would expect a strong negative correlation for the matching cell types. So uh, the best match is shown in uh, is blue with a box around it. So for example, layer two, three here. 
we find the best match, it's here. So layer two, three and ours is best matched with layer two, three in this other study. Um, so a lot of them match quite well. Some of them aren't as clear. Um, this sort of absence of any mapping to oligodendrocytes as well as astrocytes was a good confirmation. So um, although clustering is kind of an art and not so much a science, uh, there, there are some differences between the data sets, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's still kind of needs some more work in terms of ironing out those differences. There's a, we did a similar correlation with, uh, with the human study uh, as well compared to ours. And you can see, for example, uh, there's one excitatory class in, in the human sample, uh, single cell RNA that is nicely correlated with our layer two, three. In their study, they didn't layer, uh, label them by the layers. So it's, uh, you can't directly compare that way. But then for example, um, they have an excitatory cluster here, excitatory four, where they detected um, multiple, we detected multiple clusters that are best matched with that. So once again, there are some similarities and there are some differences that will, in the end, need to be ironed out a bit. Um, but overall, there's relatively good uh, correlation between the two. Uh, so in this slide, what I just wanted to show is that we wanted to make sure our uh, experimental uh, variables weren't really confounding the clustering. So for example, the library pool um, is, is, uncorrelated, is uncorrelated with the clustering that we're getting um, these uh, adapter sequences are not correlated with the clustering that we're getting. And then also the number of clonal, non-clonal reads that we obtain in the end is not correlated with the clustering. So this is sort of a good uh, validation that the clustering is really being driven by the true methylation signal. Um, and so we wanted to compare next some experimental parameters because this is a method you know, that we, we think people will find useful and that they'll use. And so how many cells do you need to collect um, uh, what kind of coverage do you need in those cells to be able to, to answer the questions that you're getting, uh, that you have. And so on the plot on the left, what I'm showing is what happens if we downsample the cells. So on the left, um, we, if we only use a thousand cells and we run TSNI on it, you can see that the structure is very largely still present with a thousand cells. Um, with 500 cells on the right, the structure is actually still pretty present, but uh, it's a bit degenerated at that point. So we do think that although we used about 3,000 cells in each of our samples, um, that you could use fewer cells. And clearly that's gonna depend on the structure that is in the data set that you're using. Now on the right, we're showing the downsampling of reads. So I said on average, we had about um, a 5% coverage um, in our genome. So if you use 100% of the reads, then you get a, a TSNI that's clearly quite similar to what I've been showing you. Now, if you reduce it to down to about 40% of the reads, the structure is still very present as well as down to about 20% of the reads. It starts to degenerate a little bit, but then when you get to 10%, it kind of, uh, the structure is, is largely lost. So this shows that, you know, the, although we have about 5% five, uh, 5 of the genome covered, you could probably reduce that and sample from a larger number of cells to, to possibly tap into some minority cell types that uh, may not be able to detect at higher coverage. Um, and then another question we thought would be of, uh, of interest to others is that we use non-CG methylation in our experiment because neurons have non-CG methylation and it varies over a larger spatial time scale or spatial scale, which works well with our binning. Now, most cell types don't have non-CG methylation, so would CG methylation be able to recapitulate these clusters? And we find largely that if we run TSNI just on the CG methylation, that you do indeed detect um, pretty strong cluster separation um, between the different layers. So, and then furthermore, if you uh, use the non-CG methylation just in intragenic regions versus intergenic regions, you can strikingly pick up large structure in intergenic regions as well using this. So it suggests that there's some important regulatory information out there in these intergenic regions that can be used to identify cell types. Okay, so the next thing we wanted to do is to uh, basically see can our methylation results predict a marker gene in terms of expression. Now on the left, uh, I'm showing you uh, the, the methylation plot of parvel bumin hypomethylation. So there's a little blue area there on the, the right that is circled. You can see hypomethylation uh, at parvalbumin, the gene. 
Um, it's a little, the, the coloring is a little um, not so clear because the problem is that parvalbumin is a shorter gene, so our methylation signal is not super strong in a shorter gene. However, we found another uh, gene, ADGRA3, which seemed to have a stronger signal and also mark parvalbumin cells. So we used double and C2 to try to validate this. Um, so this is going from methylation to RNA, and you can see the parvalbumin staining here, the ADGRA3 staining here, and then there's quite a nice overlap between the two of these, which suggests that, there, uh, that ADGRA3 may possibly be a marker as well for parvalbumin cells that could be used. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears from the non-CG methylation back to the CG methylation. So uh, we called uh, differentially methylated regions, which are called DMRs, uh, between all of our cell types, and we detected about 500,000 of these in each species. And so this plot is really just kind of showing you how these are stratified across the different cell types. So on the left, we have mouse. And for example, in this box here, we're showing you what the methylation looks like at that DMR in layer 2-3 um, and in the other cell types. And so the box indicates where the methylation is significantly hypomethylated. So you can see that this first line corresponds to uh, DMRs that are specific to layer 2-3. Um, and there are about 10,000 of those that we detect, I think. Uh, yeah, about 10,000 DMRs that we detect that are specific to layer 2-3. Now, the next row is showing that there are some that are, correspond between layer 2-3 and layer 4. So um, this is just kind of a, a big picture view of what the DMRs look like. Um, we wanted to analyze them in more depth to understand kind of how they're distributed throughout the genome, um, and then also what sort of transcription factors are associated with those, which I'll go into in the next slide. So uh, the plot at the top is showing how DMRs are distributed in mouse. So the orange line that is here in bold is showing that about 44% of DMRs are within 20 KB of a gene transcription start site, whereas the other 55% are distal to gene transcription, transcription start sites. Um, and this is largely consistent with uh, where enhancers fall using a, a software that we use to predict them um, called uh, Reptile. And then also ATAC-seq peaks follow a very similar distribution and ATAC-seq is measuring exposed chromatin basically. So all three of these kind of uh, regulatory uh, markers are distributed pretty evenly throughout the, are pretty similarly throughout the genome both distally and proximal to transcription start sites. Whereas this control that we're showing here, H3K for trimethylation marks active promoters, you can see that it is largely distributed just at promoters, which is what we would expect. Um, human, we didn't have all these other samples to sort of validate against, but you can see for the DMRs at least, it follows a very similar distribution with mouse. Um, about 50% are within 20 KB of a transcription start site, whereas the other half are distal. Um, and then just to uh, show you kind of how they're uh, distributed through different regulatory regions, we find uh, a large majority, or not a large majority, uh, a large part of them are in intronic regions, both in human and uh, mouse. There are some in repeat regions as well, a large number of repeat regions and intragenic regions. So these are largely where we find these CG DMRs. Okay. And so the next thing we wanted to do is, you know, try to trace back to transcription factors that are associated with these DMRs. Um, so DNA methylation can suppress the binding of transcription factors, and so its absence uh, allows for the binding of transcription factors. And we can use motif analysis of our DMRs to identify cell type specific mechanisms of gene regulation, such as these transcription factors. Um, and so we use a, a technique basically like Homer to um, identify in each cell type, what, um, what our DMRs were enriched for in terms of motifs, and thus what transcription factors those are associated with. So um, the, this here is layer two, three, mouse, human. Um, these are different transcription factors that we found enrichment for throughout different layers. And you can see, for example, EGR2 is enriched both in mouse and human in layer two, three, uh, in terms of its motif. Now, there are some differences. Uh, for example, FOSS, you see pretty strong enrichment throughout multiple, oops, 
uh, you see pretty strong enrichment throughout multiple cell types in human, whereas you um, don't see those necessarily in mouse. For example, in layer two, three, and layer four, the, the FOSS associated motif is not really showing up in the DMRs. Um, now, looking below in this bottom panel, we did sort of a comparison more directly between species, and the asterisk is indicating where you find significant enrichment in one species and significant depletion in another species. So for example, the nuclear factor one, we find significant enrichment of its binding sites in, uh, in uh, deep layer two cells in, uh, or deep layer three cells in human, whereas in mouse, we find that it's actually depleted. <clears throat> so this could be sort of an evolutionary difference that occurs. Um, okay. And then also uh, we wanted to take a look at, at super enhancers. Uh, so super enhancers are clusters of enhancers that drive genes that are essential for cellular identity. And now we've shown in previous work that large hypo-CG DMRs are associated with tissue specific super enhancers. And uh, we wanted to just sort of re recapitulate that finding here. Um, on the x-axis, what we're showing is the length of the DMR. And the black line is just telling you how many there are. So basically, um, most, most of the DMRs are very small in length. However, you do get this large sort of peak at the end uh, where they're, um, uh, the, they're about, uh, what is it, about 40,000 large DMRs that we detect in here. Um, and so if you look at the associated uh, H3K27 acetylation, which is a super enhancer marker, um, you find that these large DMRs tend to have the most enrichment for this uh, histone marker. And so as further validation, sorry, let me clarify. This, this marker here, uh, the acetylation that we got was from pan-excitatory neurons. Um, so we were comparing those with the DMRs in layer 2-3, which is why you get the consistency. Um, to further validate that, we're looking at our DMRs in layer 2-3, as a function of, uh, let me see here, uh, the overlap with the super enhancers in layer two, three, you can see as the DMRs get very large, the uh, overlap with super enhancers increases. Whereas if we take DMRs in an inhibitory cell type, as the DMRs get larger, it actually doesn't increase in overlap with super enhancers. So this is showing that there's some cell type specificity to this. Um, and so, so basically using large super, uh, large CG DMRs as proxies for super enhancers, uh, I'm showing some what the, the large DMRs look like. Um, for example, on the left here uh, in mouse, we have BCL11B. You can see that it is um, possibly a super enhancer in deep layer three, deep layer six, as well as layer five, um, two in mouse. Um, the browser on the right, is kind of like our version of the USC, uh, UCSC browser. You're looking at the gene body of BCL11B here, the transcription start site, and then it goes down along the gene body. The green ticks correspond to methylation level. So you can see that in layer 5.2, we have this large area of the gene body which is missing methylation. And similarly in layer 6, um, we, we observe a bit of this pattern as well. Now the interesting thing is that if you look between mouse and human, there's actually a sort of a divergence. So in human, we only see BCL11B is, uh, is showing up as a possible super enhancer in these layer six cells, whereas this layer five cell seems to have been, um, to, to have lost that super enhancer possibly over the course of evolution, or maybe it arose in mouse as a, as a unique super enhancer to mouse. Um, so this was for the excitatory neurons. Now this page is showing inhibitory neurons. Um, for example, LHX6, you can see it is a, uh, uh, seems to be a super enhancer in somatostatin, parvalbumin, and there's large levels of hypomethylation as well in NGLF neurons. Um, so uh, in human, we find a very similar pattern, and that is just sort of further shown here on the right where we're looking at the browser view. You can see that almost the whole gene body is, is lacking methylation in numerous cell types suggesting that it's, uh, this large DMR is probably a super enhancer that is really helping to establish and maintain the identity of, uh, of these cell types. 
And, and also just to point out, one of the findings in the paper was that we identified sort of two subclasses of parvo human neurons. Um, and basically, if you look in these two lines here, parvo human two has numerous super enhancers that we don't see in parvo human type one, whereas parvo human type one has other enhancers. So this super enhancers. So this gave us pretty uh, good confidence that there are some uh, fundamental differences between these two cell types, which suggests that they're distinct. Um, so in this, uh, we're just, uh, at this point, I'm gonna sort of look at a comparison between mouse and human. So this is just showing a correlation between the, the mouse cells uh, using our methylation data and the human neuron types as well. Um, you can see, for example, layer two, three, they nicely correlate maximally with each other. Uh, whereas this layer five type in mouse, course correlates best with numerous cell types in humans. So it's possible that this, uh, this cell type may have diverged over the course of evolution in human and generated multiple cell types. Um, similarly with uh, somatostatin, we get a cell type that diverges in human. However, there's also a unique cell type in mouse in terms of somatostatin as well. Um, to, to, to compare the two species, one thing that we did was after we matched the cells, uh, matched the classes across the two species, we just took their global methylation levels to see if they're still correlated and that this is conserved across species. And indeed, on the left, we're showing the non-CG methylation correlation, and it's very strong positive correlation. And on the right, we're showing the CG version of this plot, which is also nicely conserved both in inhibitory and excitatory neurons. And finally here, we wanted to um, look at how methylation at DMRs is conserved across species. So if you have a DMR in mouse, for example, is the methylation level at that position in human still pretty similar or has it largely diverged? Um, and so what you can see is there's this unique pattern that separates the inhibitory cell types from the excitatory cell types. So the methylation level um, sort of up here in the upper corner is, is lower than it is here in the right, the bottom right corner. So the bottom right corresponds to inhibitory cell types, and this corresponds to excitatory cell types. So what it's saying is that the methylation levels in inhibitory cell types between mouse and human is more conserved um, than it is in excitatory cell types. And so this could be partly because of selection. It could be uh, partly driven by sequence conservation as well. So we checked out the sequence conservation as well. Um, and we find um, using, using the FASTCON score, which is just kind of a metric to uh, quantify sequence conservation, uh, we find that the uh, inhibitory cell types show stronger conservation of sequence as well in, in these DMRs than do the excitatory ones. So, so the two effects are sort of uh, kind of mixed together and stuff, but we do think that there is some, some conservation uh, uh, of the methylation preferentially in the, in the inhibitory cell types over the excitatory cell types. So just uh, in conclusion, we identified 16 neuronal cell types in mouse and 21 in human with an expanded diversity of deep layer neurons. Um, there are multiple cell types in human, uh, layer five, layer six, VIP, uh, parvalbumin and somatostatin that mapped back to a single type in mouse, suggesting sort of an expansion of these cell types in human. The CG methylation recapitulated cell type clusters suggesting single cell methylomes could be used in tissues with low levels of non-CG methylation. And the single cell methylomes identified uh, putative regulatory elements that inform how cell identity can be established and maintained. And then I also just wanted to uh, sort of point you guys back to the website again. Um, it's brainome.org. If for some reason you have issues with that URL, there's also this more direct URL here on the right. Um, this is just a screenshot of the, the website. It has really cool tools on there that we've built um, that allow you to pick your favorite gene. You can see what the methylation levels look like in different uh, cell types for your gene, both in human and mouse. You get nice box plots. Um, and it can be a good tool to sort of get a sense of your gene of interest, what cell types it may be expressed in, and what, uh, what cell types it may not be affiliated with.
So uh, in closing, I just wanted to uh, go back to our team. Uh, like I said, it was a huge collaboration. I just want to thank everyone for their hard work uh, and just acknowledge them here. Um, and I believe that's all that I have.